1521, Hernán Cortés, a Spanish conquistador, laid siege to Tenochtitlan, the capital city of the Aztecs. With hundreds of Spanish soldiers and thousands of allies from rival indigenous empires, he conquered the city and decimated the Aztecs, who were already weakened by European diseases. This event, along with many others, paved the way for a Eurocentric world. Spain and the other European nations soon dominated the globe as no other region had done so before or since. In this first map, you see the world as it is today. Now, the second is a thematic map called a cartogram. A cartogram is where a specific variable is substituted for land area. In this instance, it's measuring relative wealth in 1500. So we can go back to seeing the world as it is today and go back in time uh, to see where it was in 1500, according to wealth. You can see while Europe is wealthy, no single country in this region is quite as wealthy as, let's say, India or China. Those countries were far richer for far longer. So we ask a question. Why didn't China, for example, discover and conquer the Americas? Well, like many of the best stories, it began a long, long time ago. So, in this first video of the new unit, we're going to take a look at geography's role in disparity and ask ourselves this essential question. How is it that Europe found itself in a position to dominate the new world? Europe, an area in which agriculture did not originate, became the most dominant region in the world by the 1500s. So how did they do it? It should be no surprise that one of the main reasons I'll give you is geography. Yeah! Now, crops and animals outside of their natural habitat tend to die out fairly quickly, especially if moved north or south of their original locations. A good example of this that you should know well are oranges. In Florida, oranges thrive, but move a few hundred miles north, and they're virtually impossible to grow. One night of frost, and entire crops can be lost. So the spread of people, food, animals, and ideas occur more efficiently along an east-west axis as opposed to a north-south axis. This is due to comparable climate and length of day along similar lines of latitude. So innovations diffused or spread more easily across the supercontinent of Eurasia, as you can see, going from places like the Fertile Crescent over to Europe. Consequently, the same thing did not occur to the same degree in the continents of Africa or even into the Americas. In the ancient world, the most valuable crops and animals emerged in the Fertile Crescent. They domesticated crops such as wheat and barley, even peas and flax, which is used for linen. And they also domesticated animals such as cows, goats, sheep, and pigs. Over thousands of years of migration and trade, these crops and animals made their way into Europe, in large part due to the Europeans' geographic location. And many of the animals that made their way into Europe were used as beasts of burden such as oxen, and even more productive were horses, who could pull plows much faster and could be ridden much more efficiently. The heavy horse collar diffused from China to Europe around the 8th or 9th century. It transferred weight to the shoulders of the horse, preventing choking and enabling the tilling of the more rocky soils that you tended to see in Europe. And over time, perhaps one of the greatest benefits, an unintended benefit, helped the Europeans as they developed an improved immunity towards disease. Since large mammals and humans have somewhat similar circulation systems, diseases can be more easily transferred between them. Many people died from animal-borne diseases such as the plague or influenza, or as you can see here, cowpox. And those who survived passed their immunity on to the next generation. Remember the Silk Road? Well, the Europeans were also fortunate in that they acquired many technologically superior sailing advances from the East. The first compass most likely originated in China around the 4th century BCE, but did not make its way into Europe until the 12th century CE, that is. The European acquisition of this instrument was vital for navigation since it could determine a ship's direction relative to the Earth's magnetic poles at all times. What's interesting to note is, due to the influence of philosophy and religion, the Chinese use this device primarily to align their buildings in an auspicious manner. 
They were guided by the principles of feng shui in order to create more positive energy. Another key navigational instrument was the astrolab, which originated in the Greek city-states around 150 BCE. This device, improved by the Arabs, could accurately determine the latitude of a ship at sea by measuring the sun's noon altitude or the altitude of a star at night. Up until the 2nd century CE, European vessels primarily consisted of square sails that could only travel in the direction of the wind. That is, until the triangular or Latin sail made its way to the Mediterranean via the Persians or the Arabs. Another invention that greatly helped the Europeans was the Chinese sternpost rudder, originating around the 1st century CE and making its way into Europe around the time of the ancient Romans. The sternpost rudder, along with the Latin sail, enabled ships to tack or sail into the wind, greatly improving navigation and safety across the open seas. Originating in China again was gunpowder that made its way to the European mainland by the mid to late 13th century. Mixing potassium nitrate, known as saltpeter, along with sulfur and charcoal in varying proportions, the Chinese developed fireworks, early ballistic weapons, and even delved into rudimentary rocketry. Now, the European use of handheld guns, such as the arquebuses you see on the left, and cannons were still in their infancy when they were used against the native populations, and they were very inaccurate. Nonetheless, gunpowder gave the Europeans an enormous psychological advantage, bolstering their desire and ability to explore and conquer. With the increased use of gunpowder and improved reliability of cannons and guns, monarchs relied less on feudal armies supplied by nobles and could afford to maintain their own forces. Along with the rise of the power of the monarchs, the peasants who survived the Black Death inherited property and money, enabling many of them to throw off their feudal obligations and live freely. These factors, among others, led to the decline of feudalism and opened the way for the Renaissance, meaning rebirth. This era began in Italy in the 14th century and ultimately diffused throughout Western and Northern Europe in the years following. So why did the Renaissance begin in Italy? It should be no surprise when I tell you that one of the reasons was geography. And you've already seen the clip once this video, so enough of that. The Italian city-states were positioned near the geographic center of the Mediterranean Sea. They were centers for trade by way of the Silk Road. Italy was also a place rich in tradition. Italians lived amongst the ruins of the once great Romans and were continuously reminded of their great triumphs. The Catholic Church situated in Rome was the most powerful entity in all of Europe, and it garnered a great deal of centrality, or pull. The Church attracted people and wealth from the surrounding regions. Many of the best minds, wealthiest men, and powerful leaders gathered in Italy making it the ideal location for new ideas to be conceived and supported. Another major factor was the culture of the region. Italy was a multi-state nation, where the people mostly spoke Italian, practiced Catholicism, and had a common history, but were divided politically among several city-states. Many leading families within each state, as opposed to a centralized government, held most of the power. This allowed merchants to gain considerable influence, allowing them to adjust the laws in their favor. The freer atmosphere within the Italian states coincided with the rise of humanism, which emphasized the classical Greek and Roman studies of art, music, and science as opposed to the medieval educational focus on law and theology. Rich merchants could afford to patronize the arts and sciences, attracting the best minds of the region. As such, the Italian states proved to be the right place with the right conditions at the right time for original expression to flourish and for new thoughts to emerge. Yeah, boy!